Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Endgame class. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and today I want to take you through some really ex uh, exciting endgames. Uh, played by Timor Rajbop, your 2021 Air Things Masters uh, Champion. Uh, this, I think, is leg two of the Champions Chess Tour that Chess24 is hosting. And Rajbop is definitely not who many people had picked to win the event at the start. Of course, as I said in the Road to 2000 tonight, uh, world champion Magnus Carlsen and online tournament favorites like Akaru Nakamura and Wesley So were actually eliminated in the first round of knockouts, leaving players like Rajabov, Aronian, Dubov, MVL uh, some time to shine. So let's take a look at some of those end games. I want to start with a game uh, played between Rajabov and Aronian, I believe, in those finals. Uh, and I'm going to do something very, very unusual for this class, which is show you almost the entire game. Because uh, despite it being an endgame class, I think there were some interesting decisions uh, made early on that did impact the resulting endgame. So let's take a look. We have the opening, which I'm not going to spend much time on. It was a Grunfeld with an early bishop g5, knight e4 line. Uh, and here we see these pawns getting doubled, ce3, knight c6, and white undoubling those pawns pretty swiftly. And here already we are going to see pieces disappearing from the board with queen f3, queen d7, bishop b5, a6, and now bishop takes c6, queen takes c6, queen takes c6, and pawn takes c6. And while you might claim we are not yet in an endgame, we are sort of rapidly approaching this, uh, that, that distinction, as many, many pieces have disappeared from the board. So what kind of endgame is it going to be is still sort of up for grabs. We do see for the moment that white is going to have the superior structure, and that is going to be a definite advantage. But in response, for the moment, black at least has the bishop pair and has a lot of flexibility with the structure. It may not actually be as bad as you would first expect, by the way, because these pawns are often going to have the opportunity to trade one of them off for this uh, d4 pawn. So that's just where we stand. I do want to go a little bit further before we get into serious thought. We have knight f3, bishop g7, knight e5 now, and bishop f5 by Aronian. And you can see now this idea of having a structural deficit in exchange for an, a dynamic advantage like the two bishops is being used by Aronian here. For example, uh, white may not yet be ready to do something like knight takes on c6 in light of moves like cd4, cd4, and bishop e4, when the power of these bishops is beginning to uh, come to light here. So instead, we do see f3, perhaps with this exact idea in mind. And now we do, in fact, see Aronian ready to capture on e5. And, and this was a pretty interesting decision by Aronian. I think it was an attempt at equalizing rather than playing for any kind of advantage. Uh, and we'll see how it goes for him. So we have bishop takes e5, f6, and bishop g3. And the idea for Levon Aronian was to plant this bishop on d3 and further cement it with a pawn on c4. So I would like to pause here as I am willing to, to call this an endgame of sorts. It's not the classical endgame with only one piece for either side. But we do just have one minor piece and the two rooks. So what is going on in this endgame? Who should be happy, and what should both sides be aiming to do? Mm. Oh, this must be the f6 mistake by Aronian. I wouldn't say f6 was the key mistake here. If you play the move bishop takes e5, uh, you should really be continuing with the move f6 in this position. I, I think that just makes sense. You can argue that bishop takes e5 was the mistake, but f6, I don't think, is a game loser. So yeah, Chess King says white has a good pawn structure. Uh, and yes, that, that's true. White has a good pawn structure. I am going to argue, though, that that is not the most relevant factor at hand uh, in this position. <laughs> Chess King says white has a good structure, so he should be winning in king and pawn endgames. That's great. But unfortunately, there are six other pieces on the board. 
So Jacob is touching on the right idea, but perhaps for the wrong side. Uh, what this game is all about is not even this necessarily this pawn structure yet. It's true that this pawn structure is going to be one source of some advantage for white, but much more importantly than that, it's down to the only open file on the board. In middle games and end games alike, when there's only one open file on the board and rooks are, are on the board, then whoever can control that file is almost invariably going to be the side with the advantage. And in this case, white does have a path to control this file. So, chat room, what should white's next three moves be in order to gain control of this file and seize an advantage? King Rob says, another chess tournament. How many tournaments do they play this year? Or per year? And uh, quite a bit, uh, I think. They are playing a lot more online tournaments one after the other because the fact that they no longer have to travel for chess tournaments is allowing them to play more of them. Okay, so there's a few ideas, but uh, actually somewhat surprisingly, nobody has, has found the, the correct idea played in the game. Uh, this is actually a, a moment when urgency is, is very much called for. So Jacob was saying that the B file actually favors black because black can play rook a7 and rook b7, whereas white cannot. And that would be true. If white tries this idea of something like a4, rook a2, rook b2, I think black would be uh, very, you know, very well off by uh, countering this idea by occupying the B file first. So ideas like this are, are simply too slow. And ideas like king to d2 with bishop f5 and e4, this would be great. But black's idea of bishop d3 is to cement this piece here with the move uh, pawn to e4. So of course, or not e4, pawn to c4. So of course what white should do is what Rajabov does in the game. Noticing the urgency of controlling this b file, he plays rook d1 with tempo, forcing the move c4 by black and now rook d2 to b2 without hesitation. And it is, in fact, going to be white who arrives at the b file first. Now, uh, now that white is taking over control of the b file, this weakness in pawn structure can start to become a lot more relevant than it otherwise would be, right? You can imagine, for example, a rook landing on b6 could be devastating for black, whereas in a position like this, just to highlight this again, let's say something like king f2, you could really make a case for black being, being much better in this position because black has gained control over this only open file on the board. How are you ever going to attack these pawns if black controls the only open file? You simply cannot. So b file of the utmost importance, and this is a, a feature that really does sort of transcend this specific position. Whenever there is only one open file on the board, uh, normally in middle games, but especially in end games with rooks on the board, it is very, very important to gain control of that file or at least be able to contest that file because that is the path to activity. So rook d1, rook d2, and king f7 by black. Uh, and Rajabov does continue now with rook to b2. And this is uh, perfect. This is correct. Uh, Levan Aronian continues now with rook h to d8, trying to find activity. And Rajabov continues out with e4, sort of taking things slowly. Moves like king f2 and king d2 were perhaps uh, maybe even a little bit more natural, allowing this rook access to the game. But e4 is just as good. Uh, taking control of the center and notably perhaps giving this king some other squares, perhaps aiming for squares in this manner as well. And now Levan Aronian, uh, perhaps despite you know, the, the appearance of you know, a boring, simple endgame, uh, I get the feeling Levan was feeling a little bit under pressure in this position. And due to that pressure, he actually already makes a, a pretty serious mistake here. So I want to ask the chat room uh, what, you think, uh, what you think should be played here for Levan Aronian. What should black do? Uh, take a second to go ahead and think about it. Mm. Uh, okay, so I am now going to reveal the answer. In the game, Levon had placed this rook on the d8 to attack along the d file, and his idea to follow this up was c5. 
aiming to break down these pawns and activate the, the rook. Uh, unfortunately for him, this was simply wrong. This is, in fact, a pawn sacrifice. Rajabov accepted the free pawn and then had an extra pawn. <laughs> and this is, of course, going to be an advantage. Uh, instead, Lavon probably should have played the slightly strange looking move rook d7. And I think this goes a long way towards highlighting the just sort of overpowering importance of the b file. The idea of rook to d7 is to go rook to a7, rook a to a7, and rook a to b7. That, that is how important the b file is here. Black should be even playing these, this incredibly awkward looking maneuver. Uh, in order to try and take control of the b-file. And similarly, an equally ridiculous looking move by white should probably be played in response in the form of bishop b8. Just saying, no, don't play rook a7, I'm controlling this b-file. Uh, and then, of course, we might see uh, a bit of a repetition here. And now white can perhaps slightly improve the bishop. And at the end of the day, uh, black is, is probably going to be getting the, the B file back. That, that is the point I'm trying to get across here. Black is going to go for moves like rook a to a7 and rook to b7. And perhaps after this, uh, black is still going to be in the game. Instead, though, Levon goes for c5. And this idea, I do think, is just flawed after the move d takes c5. Uh, also, uh, while we figure this out, uh, I was using my phone to look at the chat and it died. Devastating. So I'm actually going to pull up, open uh, a chat really quick here. Maybe Ben can cut away from the board for a second. Ben, Benjamin, Ben Simon, maybe not. OK, we will press on until Ben hears my pleas. OK, Rook to c 8 played in the game, and I'm just not going to be able to, to, to look at the chat for, for a few moments here. OK, Rook a to c 8 uh, challenging this pawn on c5, and, and of course here, the idea is going to be bishop f2, simply maintaining this extra pawn. Uh, and so from here, the dynamic of the game is, is going to change pretty considerably. Now, rather than have the b file in the better structure, Rajbov has the b file and the extra pawn. And, and that is simply going to be enough for an almost winning advantage, opposite colored bishops or not. Uh, so I do think Levon Aronian does a, a pretty good job here of putting up a fight. So in this uh, position, I'd like you guys at home to try and think for a second uh, about how exactly you can uh, try and create some complications for white to deal with. In the meantime, I am going to do my best to pull open a chat here as I sneakily do things. Mm. Ah, and Ben has switched it. OK, I think you can go back to the board, Ben, because I've done all I need to do. Beautiful. Mm -mm. So how can black create some intrigue here? OK, get the rook into the game. OK, and everybody in the chat is having some, some pretty good ideas here. Uh, so in fact, yes, I do like this move f5 from a practical perspective by Levon Aronian. It's easy to say, you know, try to get the rook into the game, but f5 is a very nice concrete idea to try and achieve this purpose. You want to open files up, find activity, because if you can't control the b file, you better make sure that you are able to access another file on the board, or else you're just doomed to passivity, and you're going to let uh, white's rook sort of walk all over you. What I don't think you want to do in this case is do something like e5, allowing simple improving moves like uh, bishop e3 and king f2, for example, when white is going to be able to enter the game with the second rook. And after this, you're, you're simply a pawn down, and ideas like rook b6 check are, are coming as well. Probably shouldn't have played king e6. Let's say rook c6, for example, king f2. And white, once again, is entering the game with the last rook. Black has not done enough here to create problems. So f5 by Levon Aronian is correct and should be played immediately, in my opinion. You just have to make things more interesting. We do see e takes f5 by white, but now g takes f5 by black. 
And not only does Black potentially have an open file to try and create some pressure on, but also ideas of pushing down the center of the board as well with this e pawn. Uh, OK. We continue now with bishop e3, which is a very natural move. You need the f2 square for the king and to get this rook and h1 into the game. Uh, but now we do see Levon Aronian has another idea up his sleeve in the form of f4, drawing this bishop away from the defense of c5. So bishop takes f4, bishop c5 played. Now king f2. And finally, you know, black has achieved the all-time goal of stopping uh, white from having total dominance over the b-file. Unfortunately for black, now this has come at the cost of a full pawn, right? Levon had this idea of c5 to find activity, and it worked to some extent, but it did cost a pawn. So of course, black is going to be worse. But again, if there's one thing you take away from this end game here, it should be this idea of the you know, supreme importance of having control of the only open file on the board. And for that reason, Levon Aronian was ready to part with one of his c pawns just to stop white from having this. Uh, OK, we see rook takes b5 in the game, a takes b5. And then a very interesting move here by Rajabov is a3. So this is another really instructive move in this endgame that I'm excited to talk about because I'm a big endgame nerd. So a2 to a3 I don't think is a move that would be on too many people's minds here. Uh, and this goes to show the, the second really, really important idea uh, in really any endgame, but especially endgames like this with uh, one rook and one minor piece. And, and that idea is the, the power of having a passed pawn. So what's the point of a3? Why was a3 played directly? In fact, it didn't really need to be played directly, but the point is simply that if you start taking your time doing other things, eventually a move like b4 is, is going to be good for black. I'm not saying it's good immediately. In fact, it's probably quite bad immediately. But eventually, later on, an idea like b4 is going to allow black to create a passed pawn at any moment. And this is a threat that you simply don't want to allow. There's simply no reason to, to allow this threat to uh, sort of exist in, in the position. Uh, I think there was also a secondary idea for doing, Im doing it immediately. And that is the fact that you want to control the a3 square. And uh, for, for those of you who have played a game like Go, this should be an idea that you're very familiar with, right? Uh, control uh, of territory. But in chess, you know, you might not think that the best way to, to control a square is, is to put a pawn onto it. In this case, we are having better control of territory behind our pawns uh, rather than territory in front of our pawns. So by drawing a3, uh, to be in a position behind our pawns, we do control that square a little bit better, as evidenced by the next moves, rook a8, rook a1. Now let's compare this if something like g4 were to be played instead. Now if rook a8, rook a1, all of a sudden we don't control the a3 square, and, and black is able to, to occupy, occupy it and have a very, very active rook. Now, this wouldn't be sort of fatal to white's position or anything. White is still up a pawn and can defend quite naturally with bishop e5. But it's really cool to note this uh, inclusion of the move a3, uh, both as a territory gaining move, just to bring uh, a3 into the folds of the white camp, and also as a preventative move, preventing this pawn on b5 from ever stepping to b4. So rook a8, rook a1 played in the game. And uh, Aronian sort of passes the time with the move rook a6, maybe activating the rook somewhat, allowing it access to squares like e6 and h6, uh, and perhaps d6 for whatever reason, but sort of just passing the time back to, uh, to white. Uh, now is the question for, now it's a question for, for Rajabov. You have done a good job of preemptively preventing uh, your opponent from getting any activity on the queen side here, or too much activity on the queen side. Now, how do you actually go about the business of pressing for the win in this game? What should be step number one, chat? What should we do? Uh, Nicholas asks, would bishop d2 be just as good as e5 to protect the pawn? Uh, I would prefer uh, e5 uh, somewhat, I think, mainly because, if you can imagine that position, it might make more sense to eventually defend this pawn with the king and have an active bishop, but bishop d2 was, was perfectly fine. Uh, as far as which one 
Uh, I would prefer, I would probably prefer bishop b5, but I don't think it matters a great deal. So in this case, I think Elvis actually has the right idea in the chat. So uh, in pure rook endgames, or, or pure minor piece endgames, king activity is definitely uh, priority numer numer I can't speak. Priority number one, numero uno, is what I was trying to say. But in endgames with uh, two pieces on the board, things do change, uh, I think, somewhat. Uh, why is that? Well, because your opponent has a little bit more freedom to, to move around and, and poke at your weak pawns. So in this case, the white king is actually doing a good job defending some weaknesses in the white camp. If you start going crazy playing things like king e3, king d4, you might find yourself uh, with a lack of defenders around these pawns on the king's side. Uh, compare this with uh, where the king is now. If this idea were to be tried, we could immediately start finding counterplay with something like a4 or something like rook e1 even, just to, to combat our opponent's rooks. For example, let's say something like h3, rook e6 were played. Then uh, even rook a2, the idea of rook b2 could be played. Bishop e3 is fine, rook e1 is fine. All, all these moves uh, are perfectly fine. Although, OK, I should say rook e1 is probably not great, because you don't want the pure opposite color bishop endgame. Uh, that, that should be clear to many people. but. Don't know why I kept saying rook e1, but yeah, rook a2 I think is quite good, or even bishop e3, when again this king does a great job of defending weaknesses. So instead, we see g4, and Elvis's idea in the chat was to push the king side pawns, and that is going to be correct in this, in this case. You just want to gain some extra space and start introducing the threat of creating a passed pawn on the king side of the board. So Rajabov takes it slow, he's not in a rush, just plays g4 takes a little bit of extra space, no need to rush the king up the board just yet. The king is serving a useful purpose on f2. We see Levon Aronian playing the move king e6, uh, and now h4, king d5, h5 by uh, white. Uh, e5 now is Levon Aronian's uh, idea. We see bishop e3, rook a8, and now we start passing a little bit, some passing of the time here. We see this move, uh, this bishop being rerouted to be able to apply some pressure to the pawn on e5. And now that the pawns have been pushed up a little bit and the f e file has been closed, we do actually see king e3 by Rajabov as well. King e6 and rook a2 giving the rook a little bit more mobility. King d5, bishop e7. And the passes sort of continue here with uh, Rajabov. Uh, slowly but surely improving his pieces to sort of their optimal position. All the pawns are on light squares to allow them some mobility despite the light squared bishop on the enemy side of the board. Then this bishop has been routed to uh, the, the nice defensive square on b4 where it can control the a3 pawn, freeing up the rook. The king has been centralized and pushed up as far as it can while still defending the weak pawns. And so now it's, it's sort of go time for white. Uh, that being said, in this position, I still wasn't quite sure uh, what the plan for improvement actually was with the white pieces here. Uh, I just I didn't didn't really see it. Uh, I thought black should probably just play a move like king to, to d5 and start passing the time, right? You know, it's white's job to, to try and break through here. And a lot of times the best defensive technique is sort of sitting on your position and, and not doing much. It's sort of one that's very, very difficult for these top players to do. Oftentimes they want to do things sort of proactively, find activity, find counterplay. But sometimes the best thing to do is, is nothing. And I think that's the case here. Because what is white going to do? White can try and pressure this pawn a little bit, but even king c6, for example, just puts a stop to that quite quickly. Uh, and, and how else is white going to make progress? Uh, let's say something like, uh, let's say king, king to c6 is played and, and white tries to move f4. Sure, now we can take on f4 and the, the question sort of arises again, how, how is white actually going to make any progress? If you play g6, sure, uh, I'll take that one as well. And, and it's not clear how white's going to make a passed pawn, it's not clear how white's going to make progress. So I thought Levon probably should have just sat on the position. Instead he makes what is probably the, the worst move of the game in my opinion, which is h6. I just simply don't understand this move. Uh, and I, I think the chat should probably have a similar view to me and probably understand what's, what's wrong with it uh, pretty immediately. So uh, 
in endgames uh, with bishops of opposite colors. We did see white putting all of his pawns on light squares, but this was with the point of allowing some mobility for these pawns, right? The, the pawns wanted to, to push forward, and in order to do that, you need the pawn's help to control the, the light squares that your opponent has a good grip on. Now, in the other circumstance, this pawn, of course, doesn't have any mobility, and by putting it on this dark square, all you have really achieved is giving your opponent a target for this dark squared bishop. Now, it's not immediately obvious how white is supposed to attack the h6 pawn with this bishop on b4, but it doesn't have to be immediately obvious. And we see that white very slowly and methodically just brings this bishop to e3, attacks the pawn on h6, and black is sort of left defenseless. There, there's simply nothing to do here. So h6, I think this is probably the, the flat-out losing move for Levon Aronian. Perhaps white could have come up with a winning plan if Levon had sat on the position, but here h6 definitely makes the task much, much easier. The game continued with rook b2. We saw bishop h7 by Levon, now just passing time. But now king f2, bishop d3, bishop c5, and just like that, you know, the, the time is now. There, there's no way to defend against bishop e3 and bishop h6. King d5 was played in the game, now bishop d3. Rook takes a3, wouldn't be doing enough. After rook takes b5 check, uh, king d6 for example, b6, rook b6 check, king d5 for example, and rook takes h6. It's true that you would get to take on c3, but now uh, white's pawns are simply coming more quickly and more devastatingly, right? If this pawn gets to c1, white takes it. If this pawn gets to g8, it's a lot harder for black to sacrifice a piece for it. So white would simply be winning. Uh, instead, we saw king c6 by uh, Aronian trying to hold on to the b5 pawn, uh, but now simply rook a2. Rajabov doesn't really give any ground here, uh, and says, I'm just going to defend my pawn, good luck defending yours. Uh, rook to h8 could have been played to try and hold on to the pawn, but at this point, again, we see the importance of an open file as white is able to open, open things up and invade with the rook and, and again, just, just win the game. Uh, the game continued with e4, which is sort of a last-ditch effort, but simply bishop takes h6, and now that these pawns are connected and passed, uh, this game is, is just over. Uh, we do see this b4 idea, and there is some complication left, but if worst comes to worst, what, white can sacrifice the bishop for this pawn, and black is just not going to be able to stop these pawns on both sides of the board. We see a4, a5, the bishop comes back to c1, now a6, and after a repetition, uh, white to move and win is pretty easy here, if you guys want to take a moment to try to find it. Uh, of course, the correct move is simply a7. Uh, what's the point? The point is that after rook takes h6, we make a queen, they make a queen, but white is actually able to win black's queen immediately with rook takes b1, and this was the last move of the game before Levon Aronian uh, resigned. So really interesting end game play that I, I wanted to highlight here. Again, the really, really key points I wanted to mention uh, were this idea of controlling the only open file on the board. I think Rajabov's uh, best sequence of moves in this game may have been this rook d1, rook d2, rook b2. You just absolutely have to control this file as quickly as possible. Then we saw Levon Aronian trying to make the situation a little bit more complex by pushing some pawns forward and opening files for himself, eventually sacrificing a pawn. But at the end of the day, h6 is just a, a pretty, bad, pretty bad move by Levon that allows Rajabov this easy winning plan of just targeting this pawn. Uh, so questions on this endgame before we move on to uh, a second one. Questions on this endgame. Sending is a repeat from a past episode. I really don't think that's the case, because this was played in 2021, and this is the first endgame class of 2021. So that, I don't know. Doesn't seem likely. <laughs> Doesn't seem likely. <clears throat> oh no, unless, maybe it is a repeat if, uh, if like Mercia did it or something. I didn't check what Mercia was covering this week. Tough. All right. Mm -mm. The whole game was theory, says Manny. Not quite. Not quite. Was it not possible for White to put the bishop on d4 and the king on e4, locking up the center? 
Um, I don't believe so. I think uh, we had this, this pawn on e5, right? right? Black was always going to be able to achieve pawn to e5, so you can never really uh, cement this bishop on d4 comfortably. Like That, that bishop's never really going to have a permanent home there. Um, like let's say you go bishop e5 here, bishop d4, king e3, already you're getting, you're getting hit with, with e5. And in fact, the bishop is trapped in this case, which would not be ideal. Good question, though. Good question. When Levon played c5, was it a good move to play f5? And then, yeah, we'll go over this, this b-file idea one more time. But yeah, Levon playing c5. Uh, OK, f5 instead. So yeah, I think f5 might have been uh, a better try. The, the problem is that uh, black really is running out of time to, to find active play. So white would likely take on f5. You can try g takes f5 as, as in the game. But now after king f2, uh, playing f5 may have actually helped white's chances by, by opening up this e-file. And you might be uh, forced to, to pretty immediately play something like, like c5 anyways. Uh, because... Uh, if you're going to play f5, opening up the center like this, you probably also want to be gaining control over the e5 square, or else things could be tough. So something like rook to d5, and perhaps this was uh, a slower, more controlled way of trying to open things up, but it comes at the risk of allowing white uh, exactly what was mentioned in the previous comment, with ideas of bishop d4, when e5 is harder to achieve when black white now has control of a very, very relevant half-open file, and still the only truly open file. The D file is technically open, but not really usable. But yeah, that's a good question as well. And then one more time, let's look at the difference here. We see Rajabov playing rook d1 with tempo, rook d2 not allowing black time to get into the B file, uh, when after rook b2, rook d8, we see e4. And again, I think black's best idea is to really sort of brute force try and find your way to the b7 square. Uh, whereas, if you play something like a4, I do think black is truly on the better side of things after rook b7. Uh, black controls the b file, now it's going to be white who is scrambling to get the forces in order here. And I, I think black is, is, is better. I think black is just better in this case. For example, something like c4, rook d1 we can even play, king f7, rook d2, trying to gain control, but uh, it's, it's all coming very, very slowly as black is getting the, all the active play. Uh, OK, so good questions. Let's move on to one more. We are running a bit low on time. So I do want to get to at least one more complete endgame. They might be saying that this game resembles the game that Aronian beat Nakamura as black. I don't know. Maybe. They did have opposite colored bishops. But let us continue along to another endgame. To another endgame. Not this one. Not this one. Not this one. This one. This is the one I want to do. And I want to do this one because it's an ordinary game. It's so boring. They played like grandmasters and then agreed to a draw. And these are the games that never get covered. If you want to watch like Agonmator, that's great. But he never covers games like these. I never cover games like these. And so I wanted to take a look at what is actually you know, somewhat interesting in the form of a boring grandmaster draw. Not a grandmaster draw where they agreed to a draw and move 15, but a grandmaster draw where they both played chess almost perfectly, and then because they played well, the, the game was drawn. Right? I think there's actually a lot to talk about in these games and, and a lot to, uh, to think about. So let's take a look. We're going to look from the point of view of Rajabov, as he had the black pieces in this game. And I think when this was played, he might have also had an advantage in the match and was sort of trying to, uh, to calm things down a bit. Uh, and yeah, here we go. So we have the opening, which nobody cares about. Um, and then we have the middle game, which nobody cares about. What are we doing? Yeah, g5, that looks like fun. This doesn't, this is not an end game. Not an end game. Not an end game. Nowhere near an end game. Not ready to talk about this yet. My god. Way too interesting. Way too many things going on. Oh, pieces are being traded. Pieces are being traded. Okay, let's, let's get a few more pieces off the board. Take. Take, take, take. All right. I think we officially have ourselves an endgame. So, of course, this position is approximately equal. Why is it approximately equal? Because both sides have even material. Both sides have a rook. Both sides have a knight. And there, there's not too much 
uh, going on in the way of uh, activity differences. No, no side really has the more active pieces just yet. And there's not too much going on in, in the pawn structure either. That being said, if you gave Levonaroni in this position against, I think, maybe even some, some strong 2400s, maybe even 2500s, I think Levon might be able to, to pull out a win uh, on occasion. So let's see what's going on here. Definitely, there, there's chess left to be played in this game, but as you see, the, the game does end in a draw, and I think both sides did a pretty good job of getting there. So uh, let's actually take a look from Levon Aronian's perspective. You are trying to come back in the match, you're trying to win, win a game or two, and perhaps you have a slight, slight practical advantage because number one, it's your turn. Number two, these pawns are all slightly weak. And you know, num number three, there is no number three. Th those are your only two real, real advantages. So what can you do to, to try and, and keep the game going here? Try and keep things interesting. What do you think, chat? Let's play some practical chess. Rook d7 to b7, OK? So here, rook d7 to b7 is a good idea. Anything else that comes to mind here? Anything else? I will tell you that rook d7 to b7 is not what was played in this chess game. So clearly, other ideas exist. H4, H5, but you prefer the rook moves. You do not like white's king. It's very passive. Smash the weak pawns to bits. So let's look at rook d7 uh, to, to b7 first. So um, the person whose name I cannot read uh, was correct in saying that, that h4, h5 it is a pretty good idea. Uh, or, or is an idea. He didn't like it very much, but it, but it is an idea. And this is actually what Levon goes for in the game, and I'm actually quite happy with this decision. For one, I think it's very easy to imagine a uh, lesser chess player than Timur Rajabov going for something active like rook a4. It's very easy to sort of fall into this trap where you're like, why don't I just attack this b pawn? What is this guy doing? Uh, even if you calculate a little bit, at first glance, it, it may not be apparent that this is all that good for white. Uh, however, this is definitely an advantage for white. And the reason is this knight is entirely hemmed in on f8. White can cement the pawn structure with pawn to f3. And while this pawn is passed, it is definitely not strong. White is going to be able to try and target this pawn with ideas like rook d6 uh, to b6 and take advantage of the fact that this knight is for the moment locked out of the game. White, in fact, may, may actually be close to winning in this position. I'm not going to say that white is winning, but white is definitely a lot better. So h4 is a really, really sneaky little move by Levon Aronian here. And this is what these super GMs do, is they play a move that gives you options. That is the way to, to win in a lot of equal end games. Uh, you know, the, the saying goes, you have to give your opponent you know, enough rope to tie themselves up tie themselves up in knots, right? That's, that's what they say. Uh, OK, so h4 allows black to make a decision. And, and that is how, like I said one more time, that is how strong players win in equal endgames. They allow their opponent uh, enough room to make some decisions and to make the wrong decisions. Now, that being said, Team Rajabov is good enough to not make the wrong decisions. Uh, so h4, let's look at another slight mistake that black may have fallen into. Black may notice this line with rook a4, attacking b4 is not good, and they might say, well, why don't I just stop h5 and, and play h5 myself? But this is actually another small victory for black. It's, it's not the huge mistake that, uh, that rook a4 is, but h5 is definitely you know, at least a moral win for white because you're advancing this pawn further up the board, making it slightly more weak, and further highlighting the fact that black is missing the g pawn. Black is not able to defend this pawn with another pawn. So stuff like rook d7, rook h7, does start to become a, a very legitimate threat that black has to worry about. But of course, Rajbov makes none of these mistakes and correctly, correctly plays the move king f6, which simply defends the pawn on f6, 
and allows black the e7 square for the knight, and uh, also allows black to sort of uh, refute any rook d7 ideas by keeping this rank close. There's no rook d7, rook h7 to worry about anymore. Uh, with all that being said, I do want to look at rook d7 check as well. Compared to the previous move, this allows black a lot less room for error. It makes black's play sort of rather forcing. You don't really want to go to the back rank with the king. You want to keep the king active, so king f6 is sort of the only move. Now let's say you play the move rook b7. Well, black says, well, gosh, my, my pawn's attacked. I, I have to do something rather immediately. So they play rook a1 check. King goes to h2. And they go rook f1, because what else are they going to do? Or, or rook a2. Well, really, either, either of these moves are perfectly fine. But let's say rook f1, just, just to highlight the fact that your king is stuck here. OK, so you get to take on b5, but now they get to take on f2. And you, you start to get the feeling that white may not be playing for the win anymore. Black is going to get the rook behind the passed pawn. And white's king is definitely the one with a little bit less safety. Uh, it's pretty easy to imagine here that this knight gets a little bit tied down to defending the king, has to stop uh, the idea of knight h4. Black's king runs a little bit over to the queen side. And before you know it, maybe the b pawn falls, maybe the e pawn falls, maybe black wins the game, right? This is not the type of uh, intrigue that you really want with the white pieces. And it's all very forcing. You sort of force your opponent down a path like this by playing these moves. There, there's very little that you can actually do um, to uh, aside from these, these active lines for black. So rook d7 to b7, definitely not the way to go. Uh, I spent a lot of time talking about it now, but I, I really do like this move h4, allowing black to make a decision, allowing some room for him to make the wrong decision. Rajabov, though, talented chess player, good chess player, plays king f6. We see h5, and now knight e7. Uh, finally, we do see white uh, trying to invade with the rook, but of course we've seen that even when it was with the check, this idea was not all that strong. Uh, rook a4 comes by Rajabov. Once again, rook d7 now sort of forcing black to play the active, uh, active option, forcing black to play the best moves. But at this point, there was little else that really could be done for Levon Aronian. Now, the reason why white isn't any worse here is because there is a nice little tactic of knight takes e5. We see king takes e5, rook takes e7, king back to f6, forcing the rook back to e8. And now rook takes on b4. So we have uh, a couple key differences from a similar variation that I looked at, where black played rook a4 immediately after h4. One key difference is that the knights are off the board, which actually does make a huge difference compared to that position when black's knight was stuck on f8. Uh, and secondly, uh, black's king is a little bit more free to move around. And white is unfortunately dealing with a slightly overextended h5 pawn as well. This push sort of did not come uh, for free. There, there was a bit of a cost to it. Uh, that being said, though, uh, four pawns versus four still should just really be a draw uh, without too much trouble for these top level players. Levon starts with the very solidifying move of f3. We see rook b2 by black, keeping the king shut out on the first rank. But now king h2 does find some activity. Uh, b4 by black. And now I would like you to try and draw the game for Levon Aronian. I, I think it's safe to say that the time when Levon was aiming to win the game has pretty much passed. But a couple more accurate moves could be required before we can safely say white has no danger at all here. So Chet, wait to move. Uh, how do you want to treat this position? Oliver Gill says, uh, why rookie eight? Uh, so I'll talk about that. Mm. So yeah, you guys are, are finding the, the, actu two, the, the two moves that Levon didn't play, but the, the two moves that are also fine. Um, so for those of you saying rook h8, uh, you're saying king g7 and then rook b8. But let me ask you about king g5, because uh, it's very important to realize that, that king g5 is legal, right? I had talked about this weakness on h5, and you do have to be ready to, to deal with it. And same question for the people saying rook b8. What are you doing about king g5? What are you doing about king g5? If you give this check, what are you doing about king h4? Right? 
Uh, all of a sudden, one wrong step and your king is stuck on h2, you might lose the game. Might lose the game. So for these reasons, uh, I like Steve North's moves the, the best here. Uh, King g5, why not rook b6? So yeah, th this is the story, uh, unfortunately, for black. Uh, if black were trying to win the game, moves like rook b6 uh, are going to be enough to sort of hold the game to a draw because uh, black is really not getting anywhere by losing this, this e-pawn as well. But it's worth noting that these, type, uh, these types of tactical solutions uh, are not... Uh, always, you know, readily available or readily apparent, right? When you're relying on ideas like this from afar, sometimes, you know, something gets missed al along the way. Some sneaky mate threat, some sneaky b3 push, and next thing you know, you're, you're having some issues. For example, after king f6, let's say you pass the time, and you allow b3, and you pass the time, rook b1, and you pass the time. Now, all of a sudden, after king g5, you, you actually are quite close to, uh, to losing. You are significantly worse off here with white compared to uh, where you were a few moments ago. So for those reasons, the drawing setup for Levon Aronian is the one that he plays in the game with king h3 first. It's just a really nice subtlety highlighting the fact that this king is needed to control the squares of h4 and g4 so that after king g5, we can actually safely play rook b5 check and be controlling simply everything. So king h3 was the key idea that I was hoping you guys might look out for, keeping in mind that we do need to be wary of our h5 pawn. So king h3 played in the game by Lawan Aronian. That being said, rook h8 and rook b8 both enough to draw, keeping in mind uh, threats against e6. But also keeping in mind that that is not good enough to draw forever, because this pawn is going to advance. Uh, all right, all that in mind, king h3, b3 played, now rook b8, king e5, and we do see just rook b6 here, keeping the king pinned down. If we saw king g5, there's no doubt in my mind that Levon Aronian was intending rook b5 check when the scary-looking king h4 is, is no longer available, and the game is rapidly heading towards a draw. So we see rook b8, uh, king e5, rook, b, rook b6, rook b1, now king g4, looking to trade off the remainder of the king side pawns, uh, and eventually now rook g1, rook b5 check, king d4, rook takes b3, rook takes g2, king takes f4, rook up to g5, and the game does fizzle out now, as we have two pawns versus two, and eventually one pawn versus one, no pawns versus none, and king versus king, and draw is... Um, not, not agreed, just by the rules of chess, draw. So that is the, the end game I wanted to show you. Like I said, not a lot of controversy in this end game. Both players just played it very well. But there were a couple key moments and a couple key decisions that were, were really, really important to understand. Because if, if either player were to go a little bit wrong in this game, we would be looking at a, a wildly different result. Uh, so any questions on this endgame before we call it a day here and head on over to Twitch? <clears throat> Draw by insufficient material. That, that is the phrase that escaped my mind. Why is it losing if the Black King gets to h4? Okay, I, I will look at this briefly. These endgames do tend to be really, really complicated. But let's talk about uh, what happens if, let's say, just some, some very bad moves are played. Uh, rook b5 check, rather. King h4. And yeah, let, let's say, uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's difficult to, to suggest a, a pass here. Like, let's say, uh, rook, let's say, you know, black had an extra tempo, right? An, an extra tempo. Now, why is this losing? Well, black is going to play rook b1. You have to play a move. This king cannot move. You can move this pawn to e5 if you want, but black is going to play a move. Now you have to move again, and then black's going to be able to take on h5. You simply are left with no legal moves, and because of that, you have to play a bad move, and then you're going to lose the game. So like rook b6, for example, b2, you can't even take here anymore because rook h1 and b1 queen 
So with the king on h4, you simply get stalemated and forced into a, a zigzag. But good question, good question. Uh, why isn't white worried about mating ideas uh, after king h3, I, s I assume? So it, it's not really ever a problem, because whenever black plays king g5, he's the, the whole point of having the king on, well, sorry, uh, let's say b3. The whole point of having the king on h3 is that we can meet king g5 with, with rook b5 check. So it's, it's never actually going to be checkmate. The king will always have the g4 square. All right, with those questions, I am actually going to call it here. Uh, as we wrap up this endgame class, if you're watching live, I would say now is the time to head over to Twitch. You want to get there early for Analyze Your Games because the number of games I can analyze is very finite and the number of people wanting them analyzed continues to grow every week, which I'm thankful for. But unfortunately, that means that I do have to stop accepting submissions fairly early. So head over to Analyze Your Games on Twitch right now, twitch.tv slash stlchessclub. Uh, that is going to do it for us here tonight on YouTube. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and thank you so much for watching. <laughs>